Good morning, everyone. Barb Desotel here with CIR Realty. Welcome to another live stream today. I've got uh, Jeff Kahane. He's a real estate um, lawyer here in Calgary. And we're going to talk about dower rights and some other things that you need to know in regards to selling and buying property here in Calgary. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you have any comments, you can go ahead and put them inside of the chat. If you are on Facebook, you need to grant the tool that I'm using, StreamYard, access to um, Facebook. And what they will do is be, I'll be able to see your name. If not, you come up as a Facebook a subscriber, so I won't be able to see your name. So we are going to be talking to Jeff Kahane. Thanks, guys, for joining me. And uh, we're going to enjoy a, a great, a great day today. And let's welcome Jeff onto the stage. Good morning. Good morning, Jeff. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you doing? Good, good. It's beautiful. It's November, end of November, and we've only had a little bit of snow. It's. I'm scared. I'm getting worried that we won't. Uh, we won't have snow this year for Christmas. So. <laughs> uh, you know what? Walking the dogs this morning when it wasn't freezing cold. I'm very appreciative. <laughs> <laughs> This is true. This is true. You don't have to worry about also falling, slipping on the ice or anything like that. So thank you so much, Jeff, for um, being here today and for coming on to my live stream. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I've been a lawyer in Calgary for about 20 years, and uh, I'm very fortunate. Like I love what I do every day. I, I like to say I practice happy law. You know, people buying, selling houses is, is exciting. It's not like family law or divorce law or anything. So it's um, uh, it's great for me. Like I really, really enjoy what I do every day. And you're just meeting people who are in the middle of a fun transaction. I've, I've got a couple of daughters and um, I, I have a hard time sitting still. So I'm always doing something, whether it's, you know, in the summer I try and do like sailing and biking and like outdoor stuff. And I started uh, building little cabins out in the middle of nowhere in BC. So get the construction gear on and just stay busy and stay happy and healthy and uh, really enjoy, enjoy life. Wow. So you're building cabins in BC. Are you building that? Is it like tiny homes or what sort of cabin? That's kind of cool. Yeah, right, right now it's just like a small little, uh, like a little gas cabin. Uh, my, 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 my fiance is uh, very, very supportive. And um, her, the only thing she doesn't really like is the outhouse that didn't have a door until the neighbors put it on. So. <laughs> understandably <laughs> oh my goodness yeah definitely i wouldn't enjoy the outhouse anyways uh, no door that's just so wrong i'm with you. <laughs> it's got a beautiful view <laughs> it's got a beautiful, that doesn't doesn't sound like a view i would like at all yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um we're going to be discussing about dower rights today and i know that this is a topic that i think i have had about five or six clients in the last um, couple of months going through that process in regards to dower rights. So tell us a little bit about dower, where does it come from, the origin of it, and um, you know the, the difficulties or what somebody needs to know in regards to that when they're, um, when they're thinking about you know, selling a home or buying a home with, uh, you know, Perhaps they're uh, there with somebody that they're married, and uh, yeah. So tell tell us a little bit about where Dower comes from, what's its purpose, and then you know whatever else that we need to know. Sure. So so the Dower Act is, is like a historical act. It's been around for a long, long time, and and the origins are are unfortunate. Like historically, there there was a time in Alberta where um, women weren't allowed to own property in their own name. And so uh, they've created this Dower Act to protect them that they'd always have somewhere to live. And the analogy I like to use is, you know, father, uh, farmer, farmer John goes into town, gets all drunk up and uh, bets the, the house away. They wanted to have an act that would protect Mrs. Farmer John so that she'd always have a place to stay. Now, in, in the last 80 years it's been around or longer, uh, I think the Dower Act has been updated once or twice nominally. And in the last time was probably about 50 years ago. And so the, the Alberta uh, Law Reform Institute is actually, um, we, they called me to canvas on, on ideas on how to change it. And they talked to like the real estate board or, or area and RECA uh, on, on how it should be changed. So right now, as the legislation holds, 
is that it only is there for people who are married. Common law is not included in uh, in dower. And basically the triggers are uh, if one person is on title to the property and that person is legally married to somebody, um, and if either of those two people have lived in the property since the time of the marriage, then dower rights apply. Um, for years, I always had problems with it. I teach a course at the real estate board, you know, you have 200 people in there and at, uh, someone once uh, stepped in for me and I said, like, guarantee you're gonna get this question. You're gonna explain those three things. One person on title, legally married, and if either either of them lived in the property since the time of the marriage, then dower rights apply. Someone will put up their hand and say, you know, but I had this pilot and only he lived there or only she lived there. And it's like either. So that's like really, really key. And, and legislation also supports that living in the property, um, even if you stay there one night, if one of the people stayed in the house one night, then dower rights could, could apply. So um, it, it's a significant piece of legislation and it's very, very protective of the person who's not on title. So, um, and, and I'll get into some of these differences in a little bit, but we, we had a file not long ago, it was a family law issue. And um, instead of fighting in the family law courts, we used the dower act because the spouse, he decided it would be a good idea to lie on a dower affidavit. And the dower act's penalty for disposing of an interest in your property without consent of your spouse is the spouse is entitled to half the value of the property. So not the half the equity in the property, half the value. So in, in the case that we had uh, the family law issue with, the house, let's say it's worth $600,000. They had, you know, like a four or $500,000 mortgage. So there's only maybe like say $100,000 of equity. And if you're gonna split that, it would be $50,000 of equity. On a $600,000 house, half the value is 300 grand and that's what we went after for our client so it's really you, you do not want to lie on anything dower so it's really important and, and there's not a month that goes by that i don't have several people who you ask someone's marital status and they'll say if they're not in a relationship they'll say single and single doesn't answer the question at all so you know what's your marital status single are you single never married uh, or divorced or widowed, or are you single, you're, you've been separated for a long time and you can date whoever you want. And so um, in every, when you ask that question, you find you know, they've gone through the realtor, the mortgage broker, they've gone through the paralegal. And when you ask them really, really specifically, like, oh, well, we've been separated for 20 years. So like, that doesn't matter, right? Yeah, that matters. You're still legally married. Or we have a legal separation. There, there's no such thing. It's like, it's, so like, that's great you have a legal separation, but you're legally married. Wow. You feel so, like you had questions, so I'll just give you, sorry. So um, you're legally married. Uh, even if you've been separated for 20 years, uh, like what do you do in that situation where, uh, I think I had one where they were separated. They ha she had no idea where he was located. So what do you do in that those circumstances? And, and we've had that quite a bit. So, I, you know, my, my record is 23 years of separation and they never got divorced. Um, and so we have to get them to sign stuff. Or, you know, my, one of my favorite ones is, is uh, we had a client, she went to Vegas on a Thursday, met a guy, they fell in love, it was beautiful. Got married on Friday and spent a lovely weekend together. He was, he was living in the States at the time. She comes back to Calgary, um, maybe like six or eight months later, she goes down to the States and spends another weekend with this fellow. And then he goes back overseas to be with the mother of his kids. So she, like five years later, she's trying to deal with her mortgage. And even when you get a new mortgage, because that disposes of an interest in the property, we need to get consent of her spouse to be able for her to be able to do that. And she's like, well, I don't know where he is. Eventually, we tracked this fellow down, and we sent the documents off to him to sign. And thank goodness there wasn't a fight or anything. He could have tried to uh, get money out of her. Um, so we ended up getting them divorced. Uh, in a like a mutually okay divorce, but I forget which country he was in. When the documents came back, the staples were all rusted. It was like really humid compared to Calgary. Yeah. Anyway, so like you get, you know, I always say if people thought about um, getting married as much as they you know hum and haw over should I get divorced, then you know there'd be less of these problems. But it you, yeah, it's um, that is the only way to do it. You can get divorced. You can get a dower consent or you can get a dower release. And I can uh, talk about that in a little bit also. Okay, okay. 
That that's interesting because I, I think uh, a lot of people just assume because you've been separated for so long that you're not tied to each other. He, you know, whether he or she, you're just not tied to each other, right? And and that's not true. In yeah. when it comes to real estate, yeah. you, you still have interest in that property. And and I think where a lot of people get um, confused. I mean, we're fortunate. Our firm usually family law firms are very boutique, and then real estate law firms are very boutique. And we're, we've got um, about eight family lawyers who work at the office. So I've learned a lot as a real estate lawyer about the family law side and vice versa. And so what a lot of family lawyers will do is in their separation agreements, they include a clause that say, we're releasing our dowel rights to the other person. And that's fantastic. But but that alone doesn't solve the dowel issue. You still need to get the spouse's consent on everything unless the family lawyer also got a dower release that you can register on title to the property. So without it, you know, it's great. You've got that piece of paper. If the person refused to sign off on it, we can go to court. The court, you're going to win because they've released them, but you still have to go through that process. And you have to be so careful and make sure you understand the documents that you have. I, I once had a real estate agent who sold his own home and he, um, he said, don't worry, I've got a dower release. I'll bring it in with, with me. Fantastic. So he comes in three or four days before possession. And I said, well, where's the dower release? And he brings me a copy of his mortgage. As I said, the spouse has to consent to a mortgage because it disposes of an interest. And that's only good for that one document. I said, well, this is only for the mortgage. Like, do you have a, a release of some kind that allows you to sell the property? And he got into trouble because now he has to negotiate with the spouse for her to sign off on things in the midst of a very, very contentious divorce. Oh. Or he defaults on his sale to these buyers and gets sued by them. And I mean, it was it was awful. And he ended up getting reported to the real estate board. Um, I remember about a year later, I saw him. He said, Jeff, you have to come to the hearing. You got to tell them that I had that document. I said, you know, respectfully, if you go in front of them and tell them that, you're just showing them that you haven't learned a darn thing. So. <laughs> Yeah, it, there, it's really important to understand the nature of the documents, and that's what we're here for. I mean, your lawyer on a real estate transaction is, is, you know, works with your realtor, works with you to make sure you have a smooth transaction. Our, our goal is that your biggest stress is having to move your stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that um, a lot of people just don't understand a dower. Or, you know, I've met people that they have no idea that what it means, right? I had one client that says, what does this mean, right? They have no idea. They, like you said, like about your client going to Vegas, getting married, and have no idea what getting married means. It doesn't mean, you know, yes, you're getting married, you're happy, uh, you're together. However, there's other aspects that goes along with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and then some things that don't apply. So so dower has nothing to do with equitable interest. So equitable interest would be with you know, does your spouse have a right to some of the money in the property versus can they control whether or not you dispose of an interest in the property? And so just to use, I, I used to be a grade four teacher, so I like analogies. So <laughs> to, just to, to go through the two extremes, let's say you have a couple, they're high school sweethearts together for 60 years. They amass 100 rental properties. They've never lived in any of them because they're all rental properties. No dower rights. Like dower rights just don't apply because neither of them have ever lived in the property since the time of the marriage. However, the spouse who's not on title would be entitled to a very significant equitable interest in the property. They'd be, you know, um, uh, entitled in most cases to half the value, half the equity in each of those properties. Now let's go to the other side, uh, and this is one of my favorite examples of something that really happened. You have, um, let's say, the uh, uh, the wife, the woman owns. Uh, $4 million home, just making up a number on that. Yes. Gets married, he moves in, and um, within a couple of days, she comes home from work, and the, the he was like a school teacher or something. Um, one of the neighbors said, you know, when you go to work, your husband comes to the house with one of his students, like grade 12 students or something. Totally wrong. Like, But they got divorced really quickly. So because they lived in the property, or one of them lived in the property since they got married, and um, uh, the relationship was so short, he wasn't entitled to any equity in the home, but he still had dower rights. So he could control, she couldn't get a new mortgage, she couldn't sell without his consent. So the, the two topics often get confused, but they're very, very different. And um, uh, it's good to keep that in mind. Very, very t different things. Okay. So if you, you've been married, um, now, 
you've been married, you got legally divorced, and you said that you do not, your, your, your family lawyer or your divorce lawyer did not deal with the dower issue at the time. Um, does that still require them to go and get the spouse's release? As long as they're still married. So if they've gone through and got divorced, they had a separation agreement and they get a divorce. Yeah. On divorce, there's no more dower rights. Okay. That's done. Now, the other thing that stops people from having dower rights is if there's more than one person on title. The, remember the first thing, first criteria is one person on title. So if you have two people on title, then you don't have to worry about it. And a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to put two people on title so I don't have to, you know, I'll get my, my parents or my kid or somebody to be on title. There, there are a lot of problems that come with that too. So we, we, we'll always go over what people's risks are and let them make an informed choice. But here's the issue. People forget about that sometimes relationships break down. And um, it's hard for them to accept that. So I'll go through another example after. But, you know, I had one where my client said, I was going through a divorce. My dad went on title with me to avoid dower. Uh, you know, the divorce went through. I got remarried. Uh, just call my dad up. He'll, like, no problem. He'll come in. He'll sign. We'll be okay. So I call the dad up. And he starts, like, swearing and screaming. And I guess the son went over to the dad's house. And the RCMP gets called in because they're, like, having knives against each other and stuff. And uh, the issue was is that the son forgot to mention the dad's name in his speech at the wedding, and the dad was pissed. So, you know, you get situations that come up that can do that. But, again, people have a hard time thinking that they're going to have a, a, a fallout with a family member. What if, instead, that family member is driving down McLeod Trail, you know, sees a text, runs into, like, a bunch of people at a, a bus stop who happen, happen to be, like, very high net worth, the person may only have a million dollars of life of insurance, sorry, insurance on their vehicle for liability. But if they get sued for millions of dollars, then those debtors or creditors might go after that asset that they own, which is the house. You know, or if they, you know, declare bankruptcy, they are self-employed, they run their own business, and they run into financial problems, or they get into, uh, you know, a divorce situation, or it could just be mortgage qualifying, where the person who's on title just for convenience. Um, has to apply for a mortgage for themselves, and um, you know the mortgage broker says, "Sorry, you can't. You already are on have obligations on that mortgage." I say, but that's not mine. It's not mine. It doesn't matter. They don't see it that way. So there's a lot of issues that can come up, uh, and, and then there's uh, tax issues also that can sometimes come up. But you, so you just have to be very, very cautious with trying to avoid uh, dower by by kind of being sneaky that way. And it's not sneaky. It's just a rule, but yeah. It, yeah. It, it's there. Okay. Um, and then is there one couple of questions? If somebody has, they're married, they haven't seen their spouse in 20, like you said, 23 years, I think, um, they have no idea where these people are located. Like, what do you do? It's a court application, which, which takes time and is never inexpensive. So if you don't know where somebody is, we have to apply to the courts to have them dispense with their dower rights. And the, and the courts are reluctant to do that. So they're going to have some extra steps there. The first one, which is in an extra step, it's any time you, you can't personally serve someone with documents. And people see that on TV all the time. You've been served. Um, you don't have to officially say that. Um, but, but if you can't personally serve the person, then we have to make an application to the court. So now we have two court applications. One for the court to say, okay, well, how can we best get notice to this person? It's like, well, I don't know where they are. But I see they're on Facebook and they're active on Facebook. So can we serve them by Facebook? Or, you know, we know they're in touch with their parents. Uh, here's the parent's address. Can we serve the parents? So the courts, um, sometimes we have to get a little creative, but we're going we're gonna to try and do service so that this person is aware that we're having this application to the court to dispense of the dower rights. If they don't show up, it's done. The court will usually grant it if it makes sense to. Um, uh, and and it's you know just it's time and expense to be able to do that. So it's always better to deal with it right away. And, and the thing about a dower release also that people forget about is that once we once they're registered on title, they can be revoked at any time. So it's not like um so let, let's say there's a couple they have um you know one person's on title, the other person maybe travels a lot, and so they give a dower release for that spouse to make it really easy for them to deal with like mortgages or you know what any number of things. Um, if they start to go through the divorce process, that person can yank it. So you can't rely on it. Um, the, you know, the when they list and sell their house, they have to be aware that that's in place, but it could not be in place um, at some point. So you just have to be very, very cautious. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
dower really need to think about it um it, and it's only when there's one person on title yeah you're legally married yeah and also one of the spouse has lived in the home correct correct and and one other thing about the legal marriage uh, okay. it doesn't matter where in the world it happened oh. so as, as long as they're followed the rules of the jurisdiction so you know maybe some people places have more of a um uh non-traditional by our standards uh wedding ceremony but that's how you legally get married there then they're married okay okay yeah and, and if you're in that situation where you're married because these days we see a lot of serial marriages people get married they get divorced married divorced yeah. so have the conversation with your real estate agent you know, if your real estate agent sees a dower release on the title they might not notice the name and so if that was like for ex-spouse or two ex-spouses ago um it doesn't do any good we need to make sure that we have uh, you know, a dower release for the current uh, spouse that you're married to. And if not, we then need, need to get the consent of that person. Okay, okay. Yeah, that, that's a good point because if you've been married more than once, then that's, a, that's an issue, right? <laughs> it, can, um, yeah. it just it doesn't disappear. They, they don't, the land titles doesn't know that you've got divorced from one person, you married a new one. Okay, okay. So you need to deal with that as well. Um, so Jeff, sum up any you know last minute on this particular topic and then we can go to our next topic um what would you say to somebody who thinks they might be in a dower situation but they're not sure if they are um talk to your lawyer that, that's just the easiest way of, of making sure everything's okay um you know we, like i said we've had people who think that they're divorced but they're not i've also and this is remarkable to me uh, had two people over the last 20 years who were were divorced but thought they were still married i don't know how they missed that whole process but <laughs> <laughs> it's part of what i enjoy is that every time i think i've seen it all someone proves me hopelessly wrong <laughs> i i would definitely think you should know that you were divorced <laughs> I, I would think so but you know People sometimes forget stuff. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Um, so, Jeff, I've put up your website here. Um, so, uh, Kahane Law. And Jeff has an office in Calgary as well as one in Edmonton. So, if you are in Edmonton, you can reach out to, or in Calgary, you can reach out to Jeff. And here's the phone number, 403-225-8810. And if you're in Edmonton, this is the Edmonton office at... Uh, 780-571-8463 and Jeff does go ahead oh sorry we and we have a lot of information more information on Dower and other legal topics like we try and uh, create like a good educational database on on both our website and then also YouTube some people prefer watching videos and whatnot so if you put Dower uh, in our website you'll find a ton of stuff or on our YouTube channel you'll also get a lot of uh, a lot of information on Dower great and I've posted up the uh, YouTube channel there I have watched Jeff's YouTube channel, so I myself have been educated on various things there. Um, it's a great channel, so go ahead and follow uh, Kahane Law Office on uh, YouTube as well. And so our next topic then, Jeff, that uh, you want to discuss, Jeff would like to talk about real property reports. So I'll get him to kind of tell you what is a real property report and what sort of... Um, uh, subject or what sort of situations you can run into um, when you're getting a real property report for your property for your sale of your home as well as when you're purchasing a real property uh, when you're purchasing a home what you need to look for as well so take it away Jeff sure so uh, after Dower uh, <laughs> well, actually before Dower real property reports co probably cause the most amount of problems on real estate transactions and, and it's a document that is treated equally as important as the actual transfer of land. So in Alberta, it's a it's a significant document, and uh, the contract that, that real estate agents use is very, very protective of a buyer if it's not available. So sellers, before you even list your house, get your real property report out, make sure you have one, and, and we're gonna go through some of the steps here. But um, basically, a real property report is a, a bird's eye view of your property. It'll show the property lines, Fences will either be X's or squares. It'll show the house, uh, if there's a detached garage or any garage, uh, decks, sheds, uh, air conditioning units, window wells. 
basically any uh, structure on the property should be shown on the real property report. And the issue is, is that people sometimes build things and they forget to get an updated one that shows these new things. And then once you get it updated, you've got to send it to the city to get a, a compliance stamp, or if you live in a municipal district, the MD will stamp them. And so there's a, it, it can take a little bit of time to get them, even if there's not an issue. Common issues that we see would be, let's say someone built something and they built it partly on the city's land, or they built it on their neighbor's land, or they built it over utility right away. So any of these things can cause issues. Uh, air conditioning units sometimes will need to get a relaxation because everyone has a side yard and the city has a minimum distance between your house and the neighbor to make sure that if there's ever a fire or something that there's room, there's egress to be able to get the emergency people through. And if you put things there that pr uh, prevent them from get, being able to get through easily, uh, that's why they have those rules. And so the city will, um, as long as there's room on the other side generally, but they'll, they'll usually give a relaxation to relax the rule for a smaller space to, to be there. Um, any questions yet? Um, no questions yet. Uh, I think the biggest thing is just the real property report is uh, in regards to the outside of the property, yes. not the inside. So the structures, sheds and garage and fence. Yes, not it's interior really walls. It's not a blueprint. It doesn't show vegetation, so it won't show trees but it will show, um, you know, planter boxes and whatnot. And sometimes a planter box can just be a brick, you know, like a brick, a brick, a brick, a brick, a brick. You could just take it up and throw it away. But if that encroaches, it can cause problems. Uh, likewise, uh, people don't think about it. Let's say you have a, a house and a detached garage and, you know, a deck underneath. And people want to put like a pergola. So they put just slats between the garage and the house. Yep. Now, because the house is attached to the garage, the city can cause problems because there's a rear setback for the house and then the garage. So it just doesn't, it, it, it doesn't work for the city's uh, zoning stuff. So you just got to be careful with that. The, the other uh, caution I have for people is, you know, generally speaking, if they're selling their house, the real estate agent will ask them, Hey, do you have your real property report? Have you done any changes to the property? So a person might say, no, I haven't done any changes, but that's not the answer to the question of, is it up to date? Because, you know, maybe when they got the real property report, it wasn't up to date. Maybe they didn't notice. Maybe their lawyer didn't go over with them. Maybe they accepted it being deficient. Maybe it was a new build, and then they put up, you know, some things they just didn't think about it, or the builder built it for them after they took possession of the property. So there's lots of times where that comes up. The other issue that we see um, more and more these days is in, in 2016, uh, the Alberta Real Estate Association, which produces the contracts that realtors use, uh, changed the contract. Uh, and it was a significant change back then. But with respect to the real property report, the change said, uh, it added the words that the real property report has to reflect the representations and warranties that are in the contract. So let's say we're before 2016, the city of Calgary, um, uh, you, you, the your garage encroaches onto the city's land by a little bit or the neighbor's property a little bit. The city stamped it. Everything's okay from that perspective, but there wasn't an encroachment agreement. Back before 2016, we, you know, you send it to the other side, you go to your buyer client and say, look, there's an encroachment. It breaches the contract, but you can't do anything about it other than sue or try and force them to do it. But no one did it. It was just, it was like, no one wanted to spend the money chasing it. Sellers didn't want to spend the money fixing the problem because there wasn't really enforcement of it. Now, because the contract has so much teeth for a buyer, it's, it's much easier to enforce. So there could have been no changes to the property um, since before 2016. There could have been compliance back then, but we still have this encroachment issues we have to deal with. And so it's really important to make sure that you look at, at that. Uh, the other thing is restrictive covenants. Some people's houses have a registration on title to the property that restricts what they can do with it. And the restriction can be anything from, uh, you can't have livestock on your property, or you you know, you know have to have uh, you know a roof of a certain sh uh, type of material, like, like cedar shakes or something, or there could be restrictions on, uh, you can't have a fence, or the, the garage has to be so many feet away from the lane or something. And, and if you had that before 2016, again, they were never enforced. Now, it's very, you, it's very easy to enforce it for a buyer. And so all those RPRs again, 
and it's just contraction. It's just the contract that causes this issue. And it's not even causing the issue, it's just because of the change that those old RPRs just don't, they're not, they don't work anymore. You have to, we have to do stuff to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm going to pull up, uh, share my screen here and um, see if I can pull up an example of a uh, real property report. So let me share my screen. I've seen some doozies over the years. We had one where the entire garage, a tiny corner was on the land and the rest was sitting on the city's property. Yeah. Um, there, there's some good ones. So this is a uh, example of a real property report. Right up here is the, um, the stamp that you see that's from the city of Calgary. But this that's is the, a picture. That's the blue one on top. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if you can point to it um, on the video here. But the blue stamp uh, near the top is the stamp of compliance from the city. Uh, people often say, oh, there's a stamp on it, no problem. But they refer to the red one. And that's just the surveyor's uh, stamp that they put on it. Okay, good to know. And then down at the bottom there, that is the um, actual uh, survey that, that the survey company would have completed. So this is the actual um that's the land, that's your your land or whoever's land, and then the house on the land. And it, I know it dictates, I don't know if you can see it here, it dictates that, that you know, there's a fence and uh, various other things, right? But that's what a real property report looks like. And when you are selling a home, you need to have this in order to, um, as part of the contract, it says you, the seller, will supply a real property report to the buyer. Correct, Jeff? Yeah, so a, a couple of things there. So in the listing contract, even, it says you're going to provide it to the realtor. And it used to say it's going to be provided within so many days, but people were just, just weren't doing that. So, But it, it, it's a bold paragraph in the listing contract that says um, you're going to provide it. And if you don't, the whole deal can fall apart. Not only can the whole deal fall apart, but you could um, get sued. The buyers could walk and then um, sue you for breach of contract. We had one where the buyers got 10 grand of the sellers. Um, uh, it also protects the seller in that it shows you exactly what's going on with the property. Um, there's, uh, we, ha we had a file once years ago where it was a ridge lot on Fish Creek. And, and in Fish Creek, the province has a fence that's quite far away from the property line. And so on the day of possession, the realtor, uh, the lawyer for the sell uh, buyers, lawyer for the buyers calls, he was a very litigious lawyer, like he's very aggressive. He says, we want $50,000 off the purchase price because your client misrepresented how big the property is. And then fortunately, our client's agent included the real property report because their, their seller gave it to them early enough in the feature sheet that was sitting on the kitchen counters. And the buyers had asked questions about the, the feature sheet. So I just responded to the other lawyer, look, your, your client actually had the survey they had all the information they needed to see the property lines. You know, their failure to review it doesn't constitute a breach of or of from our client, and it went away from our client. So, really, it was like a small little thing that that um, they did that really protected the the um, seller. And sellers are sometimes reluctant to get it because they don't want to spend the money until they get them. But they really, really, really are important to get early on. Uh, I'm just going to give a couple more comments there if, uh, on the, the what you have shared there. Okay. Sometimes you'll see something that says encroachment advisory. So yep. if yep. that's a stamp on there, then the city has identified that there's something that encroaches onto somebody else's property. And we're going to have to do something to fix that situation. Some nominal things the city will just void and they'll stamp it void. Other times we have to get an encroachment agreement with the city um, to clear that up. And then where you see the blue stamp, Sometimes there's one that looks very similar to that, um, but instead of um, uh, looking just like that one, it'll say legal non-conforming. And basically what that means is that there was something that was okay a long time ago, but now that it's going through front of the city, they can see that it existed, it had permission to exist back then, but now it's kind of grandfathered in, um, uh, in and it, it, can stay, it can stay exactly the way it is now for the rest of the time, but if you ever have a fire or do significant renovations, um, at that point, you're not allowed to rebuild it. So, um, you know, a buyer would have to know, like, 
great. I can have my you know garage here or, or something else there. But if I ever do um, something to the properties of fire, I'm not going to be able to put it in the same spot. Same as like an encroachment agreement. If you have that encroachment agreement with the city that allows something that goes onto the city's land to stay in place, if you take it down, like repair, uh, replacing a fence or replacing a garage, you cannot rebuild it in the same spot. It's just not allowed. So they're giving you that approval for only for that particular moment in time. But once it's been removed, then it's basically null and void. Correct. So yeah. you have to start over the proper way. For instance, uh, I had one where the, uh, the house is 1979 and the pre people who built the garage, they actually built the garage right on the city's, they built it on the city's property line, right? It wasn't within their property line. They actually encroaching on the city. So they had an agreement um, with the city. If they wanted to, for some reason, tear that whole, you know, re nowadays it's in an older neighborhood and lots of people are tearing down the houses, building infills and various things. So if they were to tear that house down and build a new structure, they would have to, at that point, conform to whatever the rules of today's. Are, That's right. right. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Yeah, and it's it's um, you know restrictive covenants. As I said, because of that contract changed in 2016. If you're selling your house and and you bought before 2016, make sure you just double check or work with your real estate agent to make sure that um, the restriction on there is known so that they know what's going on. And I always say, like for buyers, like yes, good to get so you know exactly what you're getting. Good to get the real property report if you can because you know we're, let let's say you bought a house. And you really are excited to put in a gazebo so you can look at the mountains and sit out and have a glass of wine in the rain or whatever. Um, but then, you know, you go to build and it's like, oh, there's a utility right of way here. I'm not allowed to build here. What we always hear from people is like, ah, I never would have uh, done this, bought this house if I knew I couldn't put that gazebo there. And so it's really important. Like that this gives you a good visualization of where you can and can't do things. The other, the other issue is with the swales that uh, the, it's called an overland water drainage uh, easement that allows the city to have those cement uh, swales to collect water and have it run away properly. The issue is, is that the, the right of way that the city has for that isn't the size of the swale. It's a meter. So it's, well, my, my hands aren't a meter apart, but it's bigger than the swale. So you can't, you know, build a garage or shed right up against it. Um, it, it doesn't work. If we have a, an issue with a restrictive covenant, like the garage has to be so far away from the, um, lane, having those change is, is really hard like, and can be expensive. So again, we have to, we have service issues. We've talked about that when we talked about Dower. Um, it's going to take a long time. Uh, it, it has to be done by court. And people say, well, the city said they don't care. And, and the city doesn't care because it has nothing to do with them. It's, uh, it has to do with you and all your neighbors. Um, and, and if anyone fights it, then you could have problems. So it's again, you want to make sure you get on this stuff long before you um, uh, sell your house just to make sure everything's okay. We, we've had situations where it was actually less expensive and easier for a client to pour a little extra cement and move the entire house to make sure, or the house, uh, a garage, so that it was then in compliance. Uh, there's issues with things going in the wrong spot all the time, even when people hire professionals to build them. Uh, we had a real estate agent built a retaining wall on his property. Uh, he said, don't worry, it was done by a professional. And I said, let's see the real property report. And when he got it, it in fact showed it encroaching onto something. So oh, you, you really have to be uh, cautious uh, with that. And just a word of warning, just because the real property report says that this is where the utilities are, does not mean that's where they actually are. My, my home's a perfect example. The uh, utility right of way is at the very back of the property but all the utilities come along the side of it. So complete, you make sure you do that call before you dig thing. Yes, yes, that's absolutely important. I know that uh, I've had one of my clients who, um, you know, his neighbor at, looked at the real property report, swore up and down that he had everything. But he basically shut down his whole neighborhood because he actually tapped into the gas line. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I did that at my home. I did, um, uh, oh, no. I put on a, 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 a extra garage, so there's a little more room in the garage. And, yep. and I did what I was supposed to do. I called, uh, call before you dig. They yep. came out, they put all their little tracer things, and so we went ahead with the job and then hit it. And when they came, when ACO came to replace it, or whoever the city 
came to to fix it. Um, they said, we're going to charge you for all the escape gas. Like you, this, I said, whoa, like here's the piece of paper. Like we asked for it. Well, you didn't ask for it properly. I said, go ahead, listen to the recording. Um, and, and they did, and I never heard from them again. Uh, so <laughs> you gotta, you gotta be careful. Like they're arguing that you only asked for the backyard, not the front yard or something. It's like, but you did some of the front yard. Like it didn't make any sense at all. So, well, and, and you're not the professional. You don't know that. Like you said, uh, on your home, the utility right of are all at the back, but the yeah. actual services come up the side. How and there's, there's no that? utility at the back, like none. Yeah. Everything runs to the front. Water goes to the front, electric goes to the front, uh, gas goes to the front. Yeah, yeah. So if you're if you're just a regular homeowner, just 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 a guy, just a gal, you have no idea. This is not your profession. You call the professionals who are supposed to know what you're do what they're doing, and and you know they fail that way. Um, so before I stop sharing my screen with this, Jeff, anything else you want to mention on the real property report as far as um, um, you know what to look for? And then you mentioned in regards to the um, encroachment agreement, and that can be changed at any time because that encroachment that you that's written on the real property report is for that moment in time and if something changes on the land then um that in, encroachment agreement basically goes away yeah if you remove the encroachment and then rebuild something uh, a couple other things like removing something so obviously if you build something you have to update this real property report so it shows it but let's say you remove something uh like you remove part of the fence or remove a garage it doesn't matter it's not um uh, you don't have to get it updated. And those small little sheds, those little, like, they're tin or plastic. They're, you know, like, anything smaller than 100 square feet or 107 square feet, 10 square meters. Um, um, those don't have to appear on the real proper report. And so you don't have to get an update for that. But, again, window wells, air conditioning. Uh, don't let anyone tell you, oh, your real proper report's eight years old. You've got to update it. And I feel so bad because someone came with a brand new one. I said, oh, what did you add? Just because I'm curious. Like, I want to know. Oh, we didn't add anything. But, you know, I was told I have to update it because it's eight years old. And, like, how do you tell a person you just wasted a thousand bucks or eight hundred bucks, yeah. whatever it is. So um, that you don't have to. Just ask questions. Again, your whole real estate team is here to work with you to make sure you have a very smooth transaction. And, um, you know, it's good to be proactive and be involved. It's a big transaction for most people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and from a buyer's perspective, um, I know we were talking lots about the sellers, but from a buyer's perspective, what would you say to them in regards to their real property report? And I know myself, I've had a couple of clients that did not have their real property report. And, um, you know, we ordered it, but of course it, it's taking a while nowadays to get a real property report because of the market's been a little bit, um, you know, everything's been behind, right? With, uh, with the pandemic and everything. Yeah, no, for buyers, um, don't lose it. Literally, it's more expensive to replace this than its weight in gold. So make sure you you um, keep it somewhere safe. Really, of all the documents you get when you buy a home, that is the most important one to keep super safe. And again, just so you don't have to spend the money afterwards. Okay. And yeah. um, people that uh, buy brand new homes with their builders, I know some builders offer a real property report and some do not offer a real property report, but you would need a new real property report or at least an updated real property report if you have built a garage, if you have built a fence on the home, a deck, uh, like yeah. I said, the gazebo, the pergolas, um, anything new. And if you're in an older home and you decided to, uh, for instance, my house is 1979, and uh, I'm thinking about uh, making the windows bigger uh, because it's an older home. They're very small. They're not the egress windows. Uh, yeah. At that point, I would get a window well, so I would need a real property report. I need a, uh, definitely need a brand new one because an update sometimes is just as expensive as a, yeah. uh, a new real property report. Anything else that you can think about there, Jeff? Um, I would just say this. Like, it, as much as a pain in the butt as real property reports are because there's issues that come up all the time. I once had a whole block in Mount Royal where every single garage was built on the neighbor's property and we had to change the whole block. But what I like about it, because other jurisdictions like the United States, I think Ontario, a lot of them just use like a title insurance, like insurance policy instead of 
having the, the proof that everything's okay. And so it's kind of like, like if I go to my doctor and my doctor says, Hey Jeff, you got high blood pressure. And I say, Oh, Oh, that sounds bad. And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can eat better. You can start exercising. I can give you a prescription for meds or you know what? Don't, don't do anything. Just get insurance. Uh, you know, to me, it's not a solution. So, you know, pain as it is, I like that in Alberta, we actually deal with things proactively, get them cleaned up and get them done so that they're fixed for the next time. Perfect. Perfect. Um, great. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen there. Awesome. Well, that, that, that's a lot to take on as far as um, real property report goes, but a very important thing, you know, whether you're, selling your home absolutely you need to get it when you're selling your home because you are responsible uh i've had a couple of my clients buy foreclosures and the foreclosures typically don't come with a real property report but right. it is worth it for you to get a real property report now you only need that real property report when you're going to sell a home unless you're of course building a or, garage or refinance, or refinance the, the property or, or refinance yeah. the property so, okay. so your bank's going to want to know okay we're giving you security based on what's on the property so you know they want to make sure that no one's going to tear down the garage because it's sitting on the city's property if that forms part of the security so every time you refinance and then when you sell okay so refinance or, or when you go to build something if you go to build a garage sorry um you're going to need that you're going to make copies of it and you're going to part of your development permits and your building permits you're going to apply and you're going to show the city where you're going to put it so that's it's it's good for that also okay so if you're building a structure outside well with your deck i guess it depends on the size of the deck that you're going to build whether you need a and how high. or not and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the moral of the story is get a real property report um, you will need one for selling your home as a buyer you should get one from your um from the, the seller when you're purchasing it and it has lots of information um i would try to tell all my clients to take a picture of the outside of the home of all the structures so that when they go to their lawyer they can remember because when you go to the lawyer you do not you know the lawyer's never been to this home right so they don't not have all the information so if you have a picture of the outside you can share that with your lawyer something like the window well um i cannot remember jeff if you mentioned air condition yeah. Um, units as well and um i'm not sure what else would stick out on the outside of the home um but you will need it for those things so, sometimes it's a red flag you know it depends on the market whether it's a buyer's market or seller's market but you know if, if a seller says well i don't want to spend the money on it um you know sometimes just because they're being cheap and depending on the market you either make them or you can't uh but sometimes it's because there's problems so we had we had one it was an acreage property not a big acreage but a small acreage and uh, they said, oh, like, will you take title insurance instead of a real property report? And the buyer said, sure, and like, no problem. Uh, the sellers built the house themselves, like they, they did all the contracting, yeah. no permits, none. They, yeah. There is no like plumbing, no heating permit, no electrical, no septic. It was an $80,000 hit just to fix the, uh, to get a permit for the septic system because they had to dig everything up and everything. It was, a big issue. So sometimes it can be a red flag. Um, again, it's all going to depend on the market and it, it just comes down to dollars. Okay. Okay. So instead of going for title insurance, get your real property report. Um, if you're a buyer for the seller, you need to have that as part of the real estate a contract. And if you see somebody says, you know, title insurance will be, um, replaced a real property report. Moral of the story is say no, force them to get <laughs> a real property report. <laughs> yeah. Because you do not want to pay to take out a septic tank and a no. house that has no permit. Oh my God. Like, how do you get away with that? Wow. So they just built it themselves. They just built it themselves. They moved in and no one really knew it. So they made it in nowhere. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. I, I, I guess for me, I always think that, you know what, if you're building something, there's certain rules and certain regulations that you're going to follow, but not everyone um, abide by all the rules you know, and you know, the regulations. It, I like this analogy. When you're driving down the highway, the law says that that little one millimeter thick thing of yellow paint keeps you from getting in a head-on collision with people the other way. 
Yes. And for the most part, like millions of people drive and don't have an issue with it at any time. But yeah. sometimes it is. So you just got to be very, very um, just aware of what's going on. Yeah, yeah. That's it. So that's, this is awesome. So we've discussed talking about Dower and Real Property Report. Uh, we're basically taking up our time here, Jeff. Uh, words, anything that you would just like to say in regards to whether it be Dower or um, in regards to Real Property Report, just as a final, yeah. I, I think we've covered everything. Can, nothing comes to mind. But if you have questions, again, don't don't hesitate to reach out. You're, you're, I mean, you would be there for your clients 100%. If you didn't have an answer for them, you'd call me and we'd make sure that they're taken care of. Yes, and if you need to get a hold of Jeff, you can always get a hold of him on his uh, at Calgary office at uh, 403-225-8810. And in Edmonton, the number is 780-571-8463. And Jeff does have a website as well at uh, www.kahanelaw.com. And if Jeff's not available, he's got other lawyers that will um, answer. But I know he answers a lot of my questions because we want to make sure that our clients as realtors are um, protected. So 100%. if you if you have any questions, you can reach out to Jeff's office or you can go to his YouTube channel. There's lots of education there. I have one of my clients that was new to Canada and she calls YouTube uh, YouTube University. So if you go to <laughs> <laughs> if you go to Jeff's uh, web, uh, YouTube channel, you'll be able to learn lots about Real Property Report as well as Dower. Thank you so much, Jeff, for joining me today. And Jeff and I are going to dance it out. I'm going to share my screen. We're going to play some music. And um, yeah, thanks a lot, Jeff, for spending your uh, Sunday morning with me. So here Thank we you. go. Here we go. All right, Jeff. Thank you so much for being here thank today. You. Enjoy Have the rest, rest of the day. day. Thanks. Take, Take care. care. Take care. Bye. All right, Jeff, dance it out.